Mars, the red planet, Ares, incredibly captivating, immensely fascinating. Our quest to set foot on the red planet harks back to humanity's compulsion to explore. It's an urge that's taken us to the highest heights and the deepest depths. We've managed to conquer the summit of Everest, and we've reached the bottom of the Marina Trench. We've even walked on the moon. It's an urge that spawned a plethora of science fiction novels, movies, and documentaries. And it's also led to engineers and scientists working feverishly for a lifetime to try and figure out how to turn this fantasy into our reality. My name is Karthi Kumar, and I'm a Mars analog astronaut. Ever since I can remember, I've been fascinated by the skies above. When I was eight years old, I got a telescope for my uncle for my birthday. And I remember how excited I was when I got it. I remember ripping that box open, picking it up to my bedroom, setting it up as quickly as I could, and pointing it out the window. And even though the area of the Netherlands where I grew up, the light pollution is extreme, I still spent countless hours peering through the telescope at the moon, Mars, and more. And I couldn't help wonder what it's like to be out there amongst these objects. To see Jupiter's giant red spot up close. Or to feel the jagged lunar dust with my bare fingers. Or even to taste the red Martian dirt. And I think this fascination is something that's innate in all of us. It's a fascination that we share about the world around us and our place in it. Wanting to know where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. And it's no wonder, for this reason, that astronomy has been with us for millennia. In fact, the very ground that you're standing on right now is a very important ingredient in that piece of the jigsaw puzzle about our knowledge about, of the world around us. The ancient Greeks devoted plenty of time studying the natural world and trying to uncover its secrets. And in fact, they did a lot to improve our understanding about the skies above. But why Mars? I could spend hours telling you about the great places to visit like Olymp Olympus Mon, the highest mountain in the solar system. When you reach its summit, you'd be able to see shooting stars burn up below you. Or Valles Mariner, an incredible trench, where you can take the bungee jump of a lifetime, coasting down for minutes. Or how about the Martian spiders on the South Pole, an incredible array of cracks in the dry ice. But it's not just for this reason that we need to go to Mars. We need to go to Mars because it's the next summit for humanity. And it's part of our quest to explore evermore. Something we've been doing through the ages. Something people like Christopher Columbus, Sir Edmund Hillary, and Neil Armstrong did. Scientifically, Mars is also very interesting. The field of comparative planetology is quite young, but it's already reaped a lot of riches. By understanding the processes that shape Mars and the other planets, our moon, or even asteroids and comets, and even recently exoplanets, helps us to understand the processes that shape our own Earth. In other words, understanding these celestial bodies helps us understand our own destiny. And then there is all of the technology that has to be developed. Getting to Mars is extremely difficult, it requires a lot of innovative technology, a lot of bright minds. And it's not that these technologies themselves will play an active role in our daily lives, but it's rather that space exploration is part of the engine of innovation. And it's this engine of innovation that helps us in our pursuit of a better life. But what does a Mars analog astronaut actually do? Well, Mars analog astronauts actually conduct simulation missions in Mars-like regions on Earth. And the reason they do this is to be able to simulate all the processes and workflows and human factors and technologies that will go into paving the way towards putting man on Mars. I'm actually here on Countertail Glacier in Austria for the Amity 15 mission. Amity 15 is an international mission conducted by the Austrian Space Forum, including participants from 19 countries around the world. And it's here that we are actually testing the workflows and processes and technologies that go into actually landing people in ice-like regions on Mars. And I actually count myself as one of the lucky few, because I get to don a spacesuit. And this spacesuit helps us to understand what it's like to actually stand and walk on Mars. And this helps us pave the way towards successful execution 
of a mission that will put men and women finally on the red planet. And I can't tell you what the feeling is like to wear this spacesuit. It's indescribable. The man-machine interface is one of the most important things that we have to get right to be able to conduct a mission to the red planet successfully. But I don't just want to tell you about this. I want to give you a taste for it. So fast forward to spacesuit donning. Welcome to Spacesuit Donning. My colleague Zhao and I are here today because we have the privilege of wearing the Aouda spacesuit simulators, X-ray and Sierra. So this is a very important day and the donning procedures have already started. A lot of systems have been checked out and as you can hear, there's a flurry of activity around us. So we're now at the stage where we've donned the thermal undergarment and this ensures that we can preserve our body heat inside the suit. The next step is to attach the exoskeleton, which consists of an array of resistances that are finely tuned. So finely tuned that we're able to mimic what the situation is like inside a really uh, a fully pressurized suit. And in fact, this is something that would be required on Mars. So once this is done, we actually then step into the outer garment, the outer layer, which consists of a woven, woven fabric uh, that is both impact and heat resistant. There's another very important part of the spacesuit, which is the personal life support system. And this provides all of the power, communication, and telemetry, as well as ensuring the safety and comfort of the wearer. So all of this gets checked out to make sure that it's all nominal before our extra vehicular activity can commence, or our EVA. But there's so much more, actually, that goes into preparing a simulation activity. For instance, here on Mars, we have an operational base. And the operational base includes a number of manned stations where the telemetry from the suit is monitored, and radio communication with the analog astronauts is uh, used to make sure that everything in the field is being pursued nominally. In addition, the manned um, stations here in the operational base also maintain contact with Earth, which is represented by the Mission Support Center in Innsbruck. And this happens with a 10-minute time delay, which is quite a representative uh, time delay for a real manned mission to Mars. So with all of these restrictions, the MSC actually plays a very important role. There are a number of different things that go into preparing an activity like Amity 15, and there's a huge team behind this at the MSC. For instance, the flight planning makes sure that all the resources that we have here on Kanotau Glacier can be used to best effect to make sure that the scientific return is maximized. There's also the flight control team, which engages with the operational base here to make sure that all the plans are being executed nominally and that the uh, analog astronauts are safe and that whatever experiments are being conducted are being conducted as the science team requires. And then all the operations actually are also um, maintained through radio communication, which is also delayed as mentioned previously. So the outreach uh, that we pursue with Amadi 15, which is an important component, is also part of what happens in the uh, mission support center in Innsbruck. Now, as you can understand from this, there's a very big team behind Amadi 15. And in fact, the analog astronauts sit at the uh, tip of the iceberg. We truly do stand on the shoulder of giants. And with all of this in place, you can understand that for a real Mars mission, that something similar like this will be needed. It will require a large team of dedicated, passionate people who will have the perseverance to ensure that an activity like that can be executed successfully and safely. So the remaining steps here are actually to complete the donning, and then we will be in a situation to be able to start the experimentation, when we will actually be inside the spacesuit. Fast forward to the moment of truth. The moment of truth is here. We're on Countertown Glacier and we're moments away from EVA. I'm inside the X-ray spacesuit simulator and the feeling is just incredible. I can't describe to you what it really is like to have the hard upper torso pressed up against you. It's something that I hope all of you can share in one day. And it really makes it clear how important the man-machine interface is to hopefully one day setting foot on Mars. In fact, when an analog astronaut is out in the field, they're part man, part machine. And this is something that will really help us pave the way towards setting foot on the red planet one day. I hope that I've been able to give you a sense of how exciting Mars research is. And I only have one last thing to ask you. Take a look up at the skies above you. Amongst the stars, find Mars. Step into the future when we have finally set foot on Mars. Absorb Carl Sagan's words to future Mars explorers. I don't know why you're on Mars. Maybe you're there because we've recognized that we have to carefully move small asteroids around 
to avert the possibility of one impacting with the Earth, with catastrophic consequences. And, while we're up in near-Earth space, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to Mars. Or, maybe we're on Mars because we recognize that if there are human communities on many worlds, the chances of us being rendered extinct by some catastrophe on one world is much less. Or maybe we're on Mars because of the magnificent science that can be done there. The gates of the wonder world are opening in our time. Maybe we're on Mars because we have to be. Because there's a nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process. We come, after all, from hunter-gatherers. And for 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth, we've been wanderers. And the next place to wander to is Mars. But whatever the reason you're on Mars, I'm glad you're there, and I wish I was with you. Kalispera, Femi. Kalispera, Anoya. I hope you enjoyed the view from uh, the glacier. Uh, now I'm actually in the Mission Support Center in Innsbruck, and I thought I'd give you a little bit of a tour of what's going on. So today I've been stationed at the Earthcom console, and this is a very important position on Earth here in Innsbruck, because it's the sole point of contact with Mars. So everything that happens here in the MSC when we have to maintain communication with uh, the analog astronauts on Mars happens through this console. Beyond that, though, the MSC is much larger. So we are, in fact, right now in the flight control room. And as you can see, there are a number of consoles here, a lot of very busy colleagues. Um, we have, of course, the flight directors who are situated next to me, and they uh, take care of basically orchestrating all of the events that happen on a typical Martian day. Um, and they are supported by an excellent team. To uh, my left, we have the biomedical engineer. They ensure that, uh, based on the telemetry that comes through from Mars, that the analog astronauts are healthy and safe. And if they pick up on anything that uh, they need to be aware of, that's communicated through the Earthcom console so that Mars can react in time to make sure that our analog astronauts are safe and healthy. In addition to that, if we take a little bit of a tour, we have uh, a number of other functions. We have uh, procedures. Procedures engineer ensures that everything that's happening happens according to the procedures laid out by the scientists. Um, this is a very important position to ensure that the science that comes out of what we do is maximized. In addition, we have the records engineer. And the records engineer actually makes sure that everything that happens on a typical Martian day is recorded. That allows us to ensure that whatever is done is, uh, can be traced back. We can ensure that uh, any problems can be troubleshooted so that plans for the following days can also be uh, done well. And then we have one of the most important functions in here is the voice outside of the flight control team to all the other teams in the contacts position. And that leads me to our science data officer. And our science data officer makes sure that all of the science data that comes from Mars is also archived so it can be used later by the scientists to ensure that. Uh, we have good science uh, being done. So, if you want to come on a walk with me, I'll show you a few of the other supporting teams here in the Mission Support Center. So, this room is where our fabulous media team sits. And the media team is a very important part of what we do in Amity 15 because they ensure that we're able to tell the world about all the fantastic science uh, that we do and all the incredible findings that come out of the work that we've done. So you might have seen newspaper articles and podcasts and all kinds of other media outlets picking up on Amity 15, and that's all orchestrated by our media team. So let's take a, a walk further here. and. Uh, one team that is completely indispensable for us is the flight planning team. So let's see if they're there. And the flight planning team is probably the most important part of the preparation for a typical Martian day. Because what they do is they make sure that all the resources that are available on Mars, plus all the requirements that come from the scientists who've 
set of experiments can be fit into a single day and that we make uh, as good use of the resources as possible. They also troubleshoot any problems happening during the day in case any uh, traverses that are planned out can't be accessed easily. And they also ensure that uh, any other requirements that come up during the day can be incorporated into the work. And all of this is because we have basically the root of all of this is governed by the science that we want to do on Mars. And to maintain good understanding of the science that we do, we have a remote science support team. They're hard at work. They stay in contact with all of the scientists involved in the project. They make sure that the experiments are being conducted as required. So let's see if they're good. So our remote science team uh, maintains contact with our uh, scientists during the day. They ensure that if there are any problems with uh, the work that's being done, that it can be relayed to the principal investigators. And when they're able to assess what has to be done based on what the principal investigators want, they relay that back through the flight planning and the flight control team so that we can inform Mars as to what needs to be done. Anyway, I hope with this that you've got a good understanding of what we do here at the Mission Support Center in addition to what's being done on the glacier. Um, I would love to be there in Anoya right now to tell you more about this. Uh, you can follow all of our uh, updates on mission.owf.org. Uh, we'll be here basically through until the end of the week running the simulation. And uh, I wish you a fantastic evening as you reach for the stars. Thank you very much.